So welcome everyone for this first session of the UAE corporate tax course. And uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, we had the recorded lectures which are available to each and every one of you. But still, we were receiving a lot of requests that uh, in these sessions, if we can also have a mechanism through which any queries which are there for anyone can be addressed. So we thought that instead of having a query session where some or not many people may have certain uh, queries, these will be very, very short. So we thought uh, a good thing would be to maybe go ahead and uh, do the entire course curriculum, which is otherwise there in the classes through the live session only. Uh, the idea, like I mentioned, is we should try and have this as interactive as possible, because uh, if it is only for the recorded lectures, those are anyways accessible to each and every one of you. And from my side also, in addition to whatever was there in the recorded lecture, we are adding more and more case studies for the purpose of these sessions. Today being the first session, we just try to keep it a little light so that it's easier for many of you to absorb, particularly in cases where you might be new to the UAE corporate tax. Uh, even for the future sessions, if anyone is not able to attend, because we've had uh, a lot of people today who are unable to attend because these were actually during the office hours. So we will also run a separate poll with you on WhatsApp to see if you know um, some or many of you would be open to having a session maybe a little later in the evening, India time, which will be let's say post 6 p.m. UAE time, or maybe over the weekend on Saturday, because most of the sessions otherwise are happening on Saturday or Sunday only. Sunday we would avoid, but maybe early morning on Saturday or uh, a little late in the evening for the rest of the sessions. That is something which is uh, in pipeline and where you know uh, your views will be very, very important so that we can have a larger participation. But like I mentioned, irrespective, even if you are able to, uh, you miss any of these sessions, we would still have, we would still have the recordings available to each and every one of you within one or two days after the particular session is held. Now, uh, to begin with, uh, to begin with uh, a brief background, I'm sure many of us are aware in terms of, you know, this particular aspect that uh, UAE actually announced the introduction of the UAE corporate tax on January 31, 2022. And at this particular point in time, a brief idea was given in terms of what corporate tax would look like, but the detailed provisions were not there. Then a draft public consultation was issued, which contained many of the provisions which were applicable on the UAE corporate tax. And later on in December, the decree law number 47 of 2022 was issued as all the provisions relating to UAE corporate tax. Now, for the purpose of our discussion, this is what is relevant. This is what we are going to focus on. And uh, the provisions contained in this particular aspect is what we are going to deal with. The effective date of UA corporate tax is June 1, 2023 or thereafter. So unlike in many other countries where you have a defined tax period, in UAE, the tax period will be governed by what financial year you are already following. There is an option under the UAE corporate tax provisions whereby you can change your... Just give me a second. Yeah. Sorry, I think there was some disturbance with one of the participants, so I just muted it out. So basically, uh, in this particular case, what is going to happen is that if you want to change your financial year for tax purposes as well, there is a specific provision in the UAE corporate tax law in respect of that particular aspect as well. We would cover that in some one of the later sessions which we will be having. But just to give an example, Let's look at a few cases here to understand how the financial year is going to work for the purpose of taxation. 
Now we've taken three examples here where uh, certain entities have their financial year ending on 31st of December, 2023, 31st of May, 2023, and 31st of March, 2024. So like I mentioned, the financial year starting on or after June 1, 2023 will be the starting date for UAE corporate tax purposes. If we look at this particular entity, this financial year will be starting on the 1st of January, 2024, right? And this particular date is actually after June 1, 2023. And therefore the tax provisions will be applicable from 1st of January, 2024 to 31st of December, 2024. When you look at ABC, in this particular case, the financial year actually starts on 1st of June. Because it is applicable for companies from June 1, 2023. So therefore, in this particular case, the financial year for UAE corporate tax purposes, the first financial year will be 1st of June, 2023 to 31st of May, 2024. Similarly, in the case of this MNO, which is the third entity, it has a financial year ending on 31st of March. In other words, if we look at it, their financial year, the first financial year that actually starts after this date will be from 1st of April, 2024, because the financial year ending on this date would have started on 1st of April, 2023. Since the first financial year starts from 1st of April, 2024, this is the period for which corporate tax will be payable. Now, the essence or the significance of this particular portion is that the taxable income needs to be computed for this particular period, which may vary depending on when the financial year is. The payment of tax, the filing of return, and all other related compliances are actually linked to the financial year. And therefore, depending on when the financial year will end, different entities may be required to file their tax return, deposit their taxes, or other provisions relating to exemption, et cetera, based on their financial year. So this would be the first step to identify as to what exactly is the financial year for a company. Now, when we look at uh, the various form of entities who could be potentially taxable person under the UA corporate tax law, the first one is that of an individual. And individuals are further classified as residents or non-resident. While we will look at the taxability of individuals and uh, other forms which we are going to discuss in detail as we move through our course, the important point to note here is that under the UAE corporate tax purposes, a resident is a person who carries on a business or a business activity in the UAE. This is what is currently there under the UA corporate tax law. And a non-resident individual is a person who does not conduct a business or a business activity in the UA. Now, what is business? What is business activity? What happens to the other forms of income? The other forms of income other than business income are basically exempt in the case of individual, whether they are UA resident or whether they are non-UA resident. Like I mentioned, we are going to discuss each one of these aspects in detail. The second is unincorporated partnership. Now, basically, in case of unincorporated partnership, what happens is that these are treated as transparent entities under the UA corporate tax law. What that means is, so there's a difference between an unincorporated partnership and a limited liability partnership. So what will happen is that if there is an unincorporated partnership and there are two partners, let's say X and Y. In this case, the share of profit of the partnership will be taxed in the hands of the respective partners in their profit sharing ratio. What this means is that this entity is not considered as a taxable person. Of course, there is an option where both these partners may instead of treating this as fiscally transparent, they can make an application whereby they may ask 
the, the authority that they may treat the partnership itself as a taxable person and not the individual partner. And if this application is approved, then this becomes the taxable entity and the profits earned by this particular company are not taxable in the hands of partners. Yeah, Ankur, you can ask your question. Yeah, I want to understand what can be an un, uh, means what you said, unincorporated person. Means if somebody has a supermarket, can it be uh, without registration? And can just two person hold uh, shares into or means in the in the ownership of it without registration? So I am unable to understand the unincorporated person. So limited liability partnerships are the ones where you go and do the registration. This is a simple partnership which is formed by virtue of an agreement yeah. between two persons. So there's no so there's no way there where you go and register yeah. with the authorities here. Whereas a limited liability partnership is the one where you need to go and obtain relevant registrations. Plus, of course, you know, in case of unincorporated partnership, also in certain countries, they do allow you to go and get them registered. Right. But uh, basically, here the liability of the partners is unlimited. That okay. is more the factor which decides on this particular aspect. Okay. I don't know, but in KSA and Bahrain, there are no unincorporated entities. In the UAE, I don't know if there are. Yeah. So under the law, they've given this option in UAE. Yeah, I think they cannot hear you, Arindu. Sorry. Okay, I was thinking that I can't hear you. I'm hearing no voice. No, no, I didn't say anything. Actually, they, I was just trying to figure out who else had raised their hands. Okay, okay, okay. This is not. I have got raised my uh, hand, but can I ask a small question? Yeah, please. And I have seen several. Uh, partnership business in UAE and uh, it's, uh, in legal form it is a uh, uh, it, it is a sponsor there there will be a sponsor uh, and partners partners are doing the business and they are sharing the profit I have said I have seen such uh, business in several uh, business in UAE in this ca case how we can uh, classify such entities in which group is it unlimited, un, unincorporated partnership or limited liability partnerships? I think uh, it's coming under unincorporated value advice. How is it? So basically, you know, unincorporated are, are the ones which are just there by virtue of an agreement. In your particular case, is the partnership registered with some authority? And what is the mm -hmm. status of the liability? Yes, it is. Uh, it is. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, we have a trade license and we have a sponsor and we have two or three partners. No, but by the word, by the, so I think probably uh, what we can do is you can separately uh, just cut out the relevant portion of the trade license without the details and everything. And if you're comfortable, you can share it with me separately and I can tell you as to whether it's an LLC or an unincorporated partnership. It's not an LLC anyway. And this is just for my questions because, because this I have seen several partnerships. So well. LLC would be separate. That will be right yeah. that that is a juridical person. So that will in any case be uh, covered on its own right as a taxable person. Okay. So maybe so, what we could do is uh, I think you know each one of them will be covering a lot of these questions that you are already asking. When we cover each one of them separately in detail, because there are detailed sections on each one of them. Uh, in this particular slide, the only thing I'm just trying to convey is that, okay, there are these forms of partnerships which could be there, which are we are going to study as a part of this course. And uh, I think uh, on, on the questions which are being asked, a large number of them are something which are going to get covered when we look at them in detail.
Okay. Then there are limited liability companies. Uh, these are definitely taxable in their own rights. Public shareholding companies, these are also considered as juridical persons. So actually, when you look at the law, it basically gives something like the concept of a juridical person. And this basically covers all forms of companies that are there in the UAE or any other form of establishment which has a limited liability. So it could be a limited liability company. It could be a public shareholding company. It could be a public joint stock company. Now, this is what we are going to cover a bit more in detail in today's sessions, which is a foreign company with a permanent establishment in the UAE. So basically, you know, uh, in case of foreign companies, there are three sets of income which are defined to be taxable. And therefore, you know, for any foreign company, for the purpose of identifying how the UAE corporate tax law will work, we need to first identify whether they have a permanent establishment in the UAE or they don't have a permanent establishment in the UAE. The biggest difference would be that entities who do not have a permanent establishment in UAE would escape more or less almost all forms of income which they get in the UAE. At least that's the status as of now, if one looks at the law, as well as the frequently asked questions that have been issued. And foreign branches of UAE companies would generally be covered as a permanent establishment. And in, in respect of the activities that they are doing in the UAE, whether for local customers or for foreign customers, as long as the activity is relating to or attributable to these branches, it would be taxable in the UAE. So when you look at uh, the UAE corporate tax or in for that matter, any form of uh, corporate tax in the world, there are a few things that one needs to understand. And this is basically what is going to govern in terms of the various provisions which are there under any income tax law. The first one is, what is the scope of total income which is taxable under the UAE corporate tax law? Now, when we talk about income, there are various income, some of which may be taxable, some of which may be exempt, and then there could be some income which would be exempt, but there will be conditions attached. If these conditions are met, it goes back to the exemption category. But if these conditions are not met, it will go back to the taxable category. So therefore, it is first very, very important to understand that once an entity has been classified under a particular category whose liable to tax. If there's an entity which is not liable to tax, let's say, for example, certain free zone entities, if they meet all the conditions which are required to be met by them for claiming the corporate tax exemption, then basically that's the end of the matter. But if they are falling under a taxable bracket, then one needs to see whether a particular income that they are earning is taxable or it is exempt or it is exempt with conditions. The second is once an income is taxable, then what is the rate at which UAE corporate tax will be applied to such income? Now, for exempt income, the rate is definitely zero. For taxable income exceeding AED 375,000, the rate of taxation is 9%. This limit of 375,000 was issued uh, day before yesterday through uh, decree number 116 of 2022. Earlier, there was an expectation that this would be the limit, but uh, now it is clear that this is the limit at which is going to apply. In addition to this, there is a small business relief, which is also available and which we will be discussing towards the further cases that we go. But when this will be available, what will be the threshold, et cetera, that is something which is yet to be clarified. 
And the third is, which is the authority to whom the UAE corporate tax is payable? So the three steps is first, determine the taxable income. Second, apply the relevant tax rate. And third, payment to the government. Now, as you for, uh, start preparing for UA corporate tax for your business, there are a few aspects which are relevant for the purpose of how one should proceed with this. The first one is the understanding of the corporate tax and the supporting information. What we are doing today is a step towards that. The second part is to understand if registration is required. Now, in certain cases where the income is, let's say, below 375,000 dirhams, there is no registration which is required also. But in some cases where a person is falling under the taxable income category, if they do not obtain a registration, the FTA can by themselves register people for corporate tax compliances. The third is, what is the accounting and tax period that one has to follow? This is based on the example that we saw in one of the preceding slides where we saw what is the financial period. Generally, the return filing has to be done within a period of nine months from the end of the respective financial year. So for people, let's say, whose first financial year ends on 31st of December 2024, they need to file the return before 30th September 2025. So this would be the date by where most of the people will be required to file their tax return. Then one should understand whether their income is exempt from tax and whether they need to make certain elections. Now, when we talk about election, what this is referring to is that in case of certain free zone entities, which are qualifying free zone companies and have qualifying free in zone income, the UA corporate tax rate is 0%. However, they still have an option that they can elect to pay 9% corporate tax rate. Now, this, this reason why someone would opt for paying a higher tax rate is something a little complicated which we are going to discuss when the free zone entities will be there. But this basically is in consideration of the fact that, you know, as an overall group, sometimes what happens is that entities, overseas entities, so let's say you have a multinational group which has subsidiaries across the globe. One of them happens to be the free zone entity. Now, if this free zone entity is paying 0% tax, what can happen actually is that under the laws of the parent entity, this profit might be consolidated with the profits here or payments to them may be subject to a higher withholding tax rate in different countries. So in those cases, depending on the tax arbitrage of having these profits taxed elsewhere or a higher withholding tax for any income that they may receive, they actually have an option that they can choose 9%. The next and one of the most important thing which one should now look out for is the contract with your customers and suppliers. Now, there could be many contracts where, you know, uh, until now, because there was no withholding tax, anything which was applicable, the contract with the customer may or may not contain clauses relating to who will be bearing the burden of these taxes. But now, once this UA corporate tax book is uh, applicable on the company, your cost of doing business may increase. So that would require warranting as to whether the price need any revision. Secondly, currently under the current law, the withholding tax on any payment is 0%. But this rate may change in future. So when a new contract is being entered into by a company or by any client, there should be a provision where you, know, you agree that if there's a withholding tax on a supplier or a customer who may be a non-resident, then who is going to bear the burden of that? Because why this is important is that in many countries, when contracts are entered into, generally the non-resident suppliers who might be having certain intangibles or certain technical services, or maybe in case of banks, where you know there is a withholding on the interest, the banks and everyone try to pass it on to the user, which is, let's say if you're a UAE company and you are taking certain loans from a foreign bank, Today, there may not be a withholding tax which is applicable on those payments. But if in future that is imposed, then you might have to bear the burden of that. So you need to watch out for your contracts with the supplier and customers 
very carefully. And the maintenance of financial and other records is also something which is an important exercise that should be done before the financial year actually commences. And the reason for this could be that there could be, you know, until now, because in many cases, there's no compulsory requirement to have a tax audit or of a, sorry, a financial audit in UAE. In many cases, audits are not being done. But once you get into the taxable situation, in those cases, you will be required to maintain proper financial records because tomorrow, if your return or your tax status is questioned, then you have to produce those records to prove that, okay, this is the amount of income that you've earned. So therefore, it might be a good exercise to see if there are any long pending balances which are there, some credits which are being carried forward or some capital payments which can be cleaned up, those should be done by the businesses before the commencement of the UAE corporate tax law. Now, under the UAE corporate tax law provision, what they mention is that on the first day of the financial year, which is your first tax period, you have to consider the closing balances of the previous day. So let's say if your tax period starts on 1st of January, 2024, the balances that you have on 31 December, 2023 will be considered as the opening balances. But there are stipulation here as well that when you consider these opening balances, what you also need to consider is that the balances should be reflecting at an arm's length. That is, you should not have excess receivable, payable, et cetera. So in some cases, what people might actually do is, let's say you create a debtor from your overseas firm. And once your tax period starts, you write it off and you want to claim it as a deduction. So in these cases, basically, first is whether this will be allowed as a deduction or not. The answer is something which is not clear, but generally it should be. But if it is not at an arm's length, then this might be questioned at the time of your tax return. So, Insofar as the tax rates are concerned, it is 0% on taxable income up to AED 375,000. And the rate of taxes will be 9% on taxable income above AED 375,000. Now, this limit is available to each and every person individually. However, one thing which one needs to know is that, you know, there's a concept of tax grouping under the UAE corporate tax law, which basically provides that if there is a parent company with several subsidiaries, and of course there are conditions as to the ownership structure, the profit sharing structure, the voting rights structure and all, instead of everyone filing a separate tax return, the parent company can file a consolidated tax return. In such a case, this limit of exemption will be available only to the parent entity and it will not be that if you have five entities, you multiply this five by 375,000, and that is the exemption available to the parent entity or the group as a whole. For any income above AED 375,000, the rate of tax is 9%. Now, in respect of a qualifying free zone person, and a qualifying free zone person, again, we are going to discuss in detail later on, but for now, basically a qualifying free zone person is the one which meets certain conditions, including the fact that uh, they have arms then transaction with their associated enterprises. They are having economic substance in the UAE and they do all the compliances as per the law of the uh, under which they are registered. So once they do all those things, they qualify as a free zone person. And in respect of their qualifying income, which is again yet to be defined under the law, the rate of tax will be 0%. Now, in the public consultation document, they had mentioned and given an indication as to what all will qualify as a qualifying income. So let's say sale of uh, or income from uh, one free zone for one free zone entity from another free zone was something which was considered as qualifying income then export income of the free zone entity was again considered as qualifying income. So there were several examples which were given when the draft public consultation document was issued. These examples are not there in the current uh, UAE corporate tax decree, 
but these would I'm sure be kind of issued in due course. However, if there is a non-qualifying income, then the rate of tax will be 9% on those income. Secondly, if a person does not qualify as a free zone person, then their income will definitely be taxable at 9% subject to the exemption limit of 375,000 dirhams. So for the purpose of our course, what we are doing is we are actually moving article by article. And uh, there are a few articles on exempt person, which we will be doing a separate session on because this, they are quite detailed. If we would have considered them today, then our entire session would have gone on that side. But we are moving article by article in the UA corporate tax provision. Uh, the way we plan to do this is that uh, we will do one session. In the next session, in the beginning, we can keep 10 to 15 minutes where anyone who has a question relating to the previous session can ask them, right? Whatever questions you have right now, as we go through the session, that definitely we can do right now itself. But if you have further follow on questions or certain specific questions relating to the first session, you can do that in the second one as well. Now, when we talk about uh, article four, exempt person, exempt person are two categories. There are two subcategories, which I would place here. The first one is someone who is exempt under the UAE corporate tax law itself. And the second one is who is exempt, but they are required to make an application. And after the application is considered by the UAE tax authorities, uh, Jimmy, actually for 10 companies, the exemption limit would still be 375,000 dirhams only and not 3.75 million dirhams. Sorry. Coming back to this, uh, basically exempt person would be in two particular categories. One is those are exempt automatically. And the second is the ones who have to make an application. And once that application is approved, then they will be considered as exempt person. So who all are exempt person? Basically a government entity owned by either the federal government or the Emirati government, that is something which is going to be an exempt person under the UAE corporate tax law. Second is an entity which is con controlled by the government will also be considered as an exempt person. A qualifying extractive business. So extractive business would be where there is an extraction of natural resources. In those cases where they meet the condition of qualifying extractive business, there's a detailed article on this, which we are going to cover in the next session. Like I mentioned, we're not getting into this because otherwise today's entire session would have got consumed here. In addition to this, certain non-extractive natural resource business. These are the business who help in the refining, transportation, et cetera, of the natural resources which are extracted from this qualifying extractive business. In both the cases, the exemption is available to the business themselves. Their subcontractors, suppliers, vendors, etc. They do not get the exemption which is available to these people. Then a qualifying public benefit entity which is engaged into certain social services, etc., which are desirable from a public benefit standpoint. A qualifying investment fund a public pension and social security fund or a qualifying private pension and social security fund or a juridical person controlled by an exempt person. So like I discussed initially, the juridical person would comprise of limited liability companies. It will comprise of public stock companies, public joint stock companies and some of the others which are there. or any other person who's specified by the cabinet as an exempt person. Now, a juridical person that we refer to will be considered as an exempt person where it is controlled by either a government entity, a government controlled entity. This was the first one that we saw on the preceding slide. This is the second one, a qualifying investment fund or a public pension and social security fund or a qualifying private pension and social security fund. So where these people control any of the juridical person, 
this juridical person will also be considered as exempt from corporate tax. However, in order to claim this exemption, this particular person has to meet certain conditions. And those conditions basically are, the first one is that this company should be incorporated in the UAE and it should be wholly owned and controlled. So the condition is not only for ownership, but even the control should be with a specified exempt person. Specified exempt person is one of the four people that we've discussed in the preceding slide. And it will be exempt if it conducts any of the following. Undertakes part or whole of the activity of the exempt person. So if there's a government entity, which is mandated to do certain activities, right? Mm -hmm. And this juridical person actually undertakes part or whole of those activities by themselves, then they will be considered as exempt is engaged exclusively in holding assets or investing funds for the benefit of the exempt person. That is, it could be kind of a sovereign fund also, let's say if it were to be owned by the government entity, only carries out activity that are ancillary to those carried out by the exempt person. In other words, if one looks at all these three conditions, the idea here is that the activities of the juridical person. So if a government entity, let's say, for example, has so several activities to do. Instead of doing completely all of them at the individual level, if they incorporate separate companies or separate juridical person, and these people do any of the conditions which are here, right? That is they undertake any part or the whole of the activity of the exempt person, then this person will also be considered as exempt person. However, if they do not meet any of the conditions which are mentioned here, then they will be considered as a taxable person. So mere ownership by itself would not mean that the exemption will be given. It has to do the activities or meet the conditions which are otherwise applicable to a exempt person. So like I mentioned in the beginning, uh, there are certain entities who are exempt entities by the virtue of the law itself let's say a government entity. However, these four forms of organization are not exempt from the applicability of UAE corporate tax course, but they are required to make an application. And once they make an application and that is approved, then they are eligible for exemption. So the four exempt person are basically a qualifying investment fund, a public pension and social security fund, and qualifying private pension fund and social security fund, a juridical person controlled by exempt person or any other specified person. But the question that comes up is what will be the effective date of exemption? So let's say for example, we can take two cases here. One is the case of an entity which existed on the first day of the financial year. And second could be a case where an entity is incorporated subsequently. So let's say the financial year is 1 1 2024 to 31 12 2024. In such a case, this exempt person may make an application. Let's assume the application was made on 1st of June. 2024. And the approval came in on, let's say, 31st of January 2025. So the exemption can be dependent on what the approval says. So once they make an application, one needs to see what is the approval that has been received. If the approval mentions a specific date, then the exemption will be available from that specific date. But if the exam, the approval does not mention any specific date, then it will be applicable from the first date of the financial year in which the application is made. So if the application is made on 1st of June 2024, let's say the approval mentions that the exemption is available from 1-125 onwards. In that case, the exemption will be available from this date. Any profits earned prior to this date will be taxable. However, 
if the application does not mention any specific date on the approval, then it will be applicable from the first day of the financial year in which the application is made. So 2024 is when the application is made. So from 1st of January 2024, the exemption will be available. In case of entities which are incorporated subsequently, again, the same principle will need to be followed. Let's say if an entity was formed in 2026 and it makes the application during the year, if the application mentions that, okay, it is going to be from a particular date, that's the date it applies. Else, it can be from 1st of January 2026. Uh, Nad, like I mentioned, uh, basically for uh, free zone companies, there's a detailed regulation, which we are going to discuss. But just to answer your question in this particular case, uh, income of a free zone company, if I just uh, take the public consultation document as the basis for this, uh, basically in that particular case, it was provided that if a FZD has a branch in the UAE, right, the profit of that were taxable. If you're getting it from someone else, if the deduction was claimed by them, there was a disallowance or deduction for them and taxability here. So there are various things which are there, but if it is a free zone flexi company, the first important point here will be that does it meet the economic substance requirement? Because if it does not, then its entire income will actually be taxable at 9%. Here in this case, uh, total service is subcontracting to mainland company. Of course, the mainland company is paying the uh, tax for their revenue. And this freelance, uh, this free zone company is exporting uh, or uh, exporting the services. So if you are exporting, then basically it's an export revenue for you, right? Generally in those cases, uh, the revenue will be exempt from tax. Insofar as the subcontractor is concerned, they are going to pay tax on their income that you get from, they get from this free zone entity. But yes. the 0% corporate tax rate for free zone will again be subject to the substance requirement, transfer pricing, audit, and compulsory compliance with the relevant regulation in the free zone. Thank you. So this is just an example of what we already discussed. Uh, maybe let's look at this. So XYZ LLC was set up as an investment fund and is undertaking investment businesses. It made an application for exemption from corporate tax on 1st of June, 2024, which was approved on 1st of February, 2025. The authority did not specify any specific date for exemption. From what date would be exemption be available if the financial year of XYZ is from January 1. So here basically the application date is 1st of June, 2024. The approval is 1st of February, 2025. So this is, let's say if January 1 is the year, so this is the tax year 2024, the approval came in 2025. And there was nothing which was specified here. In the approval of the application. In such a case, like I mentioned, then the beginning of the tax period in which the application is made will be the period from which the exemption will be available. So therefore, the profits of 1-1-2024 or financial year 2024 will also be exempt. The second alteration is that if the authority specified the date for exemption as financial year commencing on 1-1-2025, then the profits earned in 2024 will be taxable and the exemption will be available for 2025 onwards. Now, in some cases, again, what can happen is that a person who's actually an exempt person fails to meet the condition subject to which the exemption was given. And for each of the exempt person that we discussed, you know, there are conditions attached to them as to when they will be considered as exempt person. So let's say a person 
is an exam person in first year, second year, but it fails to meet the condition in 2026. In such a case, what is going to happen? Will they lose their tax exemption? Yes, the answer is yes. If they do not meet their uh, condition subject to which the exemption was available, they lose their tax exemption from the period beginning from the first day of the financial year in which the conditions are not met. In this case, generally from 1st of January, 2026, they would lose the exemption available to them. However, there is a provision under which the ministry may relax the denial of exemption to such people. And that basically are in cases where the ministry feels that the failure of the person to comply with the UA corporate tax is because of the fact that they have been either liquidated or their license has been terminated. Now this can happen, let's say, you know, uh, a company is liquidated on 30th of September, 2024, or maybe let's say 2029, 2024 may be a difficult one to take, for example, right? It still has earned, let's say, nine months of profit. But if it fails to meet the condition because of the fact that the liquidation has happened, in such a case, the ministry may still consider a relaxed view whereby the exemption may still be given for these nine months. The failure is temporary in nature and will be promptly rectified or any other instances as may be prescribed by the Ministry of Finance. Now we'll move on to chapter four, which is around taxable person and the corporate tax base. So taxable person would cover as in who all will be liable to UAE corporate tax. And second is how do you calculate the taxable income? That would be the corporate tax base. So under the UAE corporate tax, uh, chapter four specifies that the UAE corporate tax will be imposed on a taxable person at the rate specified in Article 2. Now, the rates in Article 2 are the one that we saw in the first slide. Who is a taxable person is something which we should now discuss. A taxable person can either be a resident or a non-resident. Right? But the question is, who is a resident or who is a non-resident? The second point is that if there is a resident, let's say there is a company and it has got several branches. For UAE corporate tax purposes, this entire company and all the branches will be treated as one single taxable person, meaning thereby that these branches do not need to file any separate tax return or undertake any separate tax compliance. The entity level is where the return will be filed. This is similar to the economic substance regulations that are there in the UAE, where basically you need to file only one single ESR report for the parent company and all the branches which are there. The cabinet would specify the category of business activity, which would be conducted by a resident or a non-resident natural person which will be subject to corporate tax. Now, natural person under the UA corporate tax refers to an individual. This is something which has been clarified in the FAQs, specifically on this particular aspect. But what this fourth point means is that insofar as an individual is concerned, like I discussed earlier, their income from employment, capital gains, rental, et cetera, all of it, whatever they derive in their personal capacity is not liable to UAE corporate tax. What is liable to UAE corporate tax is the income from business or business activity conducted in the UAE. So question is, which businesses are going to get covered in respect of a resident or a non-resident individual? This is something which the cabinet would specify in terms of what categories of business activity conducted by a resident or a non-resident natural person would be subject to corporate tax. So here, one, one interesting thing, which is uh, 
there in the FAQs is that in case of an individual who's providing continuous services, even though he may not be under an employment, this income from continuous services may actually be exempt from UA corporate tax. Now, this is unlike maybe in many other countries where, you know, if there is a continuous, if the nature of what is provided as services under an agreement and not an employment agreement, then those are considered as business income and not employment income. But in one of the FAQs, there's a clear mention that if there is a continuous service, which more or less amounts to kind of an employment, in that case, this income will also be exempt from UA corporate tax. So let's look at an example here. So in this particular case, you have XYZ LLC and you have ABC LLC. These are two UAE entities. ABC LLC is a subsidiary of XYZ LLC. And this XYZ LLC also has a DMCC branch. Now the question is, in this particular case, how many returns would be required to be filed? So in case any one of you want to take a shot on this and uh, kind of answer this, it would be good to have an interaction on that side. Allow me a minute, please. So the question is how many returns need to be filed in this particular case? Sir, what is the DMCC branch? So this is a branch of XYZ LNC and this is another separate UAE entity. Let's put it like this. This is company one, this is company two, and this is a branch. If they have tax group, they need to file only one, right? So there are two things here. Uh, if X, Y, so first thing is this branch need not file a separate return. This return will be filed along with X, Y, Z, LLC. Now, because they own 100% in ABC LLC, X, Y, Z, LLC has an option. So it's not mandatory for X, Y, Z to file a tax group return, but it has an option to file return as a tax group if it meets those conditions. So if it meets those conditions, then for all the three of them taken together, they can file one single return. But if the condition of tax group are not met, because they're in, in addition to the shareholding, there are many other conditions also that you need to see. In such a case, XYZ LLC can file their own tax return and ABC LLC can file their own tax return. So in all, there will be two returns unless tax grouping is something which is resorted to, in which case only one return can be filed. Now comes the question that when we spoke about taxable person, we discussed that it consists of resident and non-resident. So the question is who is a resident? The first thing is any juridical person who is incorporated or registered in the state. So let's say your limited liability companies your public stock companies, public joint stock companies, all of them who are incorporated or registered in the UAE, state in the UAE corporate tax law refers to UAE, will be considered as resident of UAE. In this case, it does not matter what kind of income they are getting, the income that they earn in or outside UAE will be liable to tax in UAE. Of course, if they are earning any foreign income, then 
they will be eligible for foreign tax credit, which is paid in respect of which UA corporate tax is payable. The second is, if there is a juridical person incorporated in a foreign jurisdiction, even they can be considered as a resident of UAE, where the effective control and management of such foreign person is in the UAE. I would repeat, even a foreign company can be considered as a UAE resident where the control and management of such foreign company is in the UAE. And to evaluate how control and management will take place, one needs to see where the strategic decisions relating to the management of the company are undertaken. The third is a natural person that is an individual can also be considered as a resident of UAE. But like I mentioned, such a person will be considered only when they are carrying out a business or a business activity in the UAE. If they are not carrying out any business or business activity, then they will not be considered as a resident of UAE. And other entities which may be determined under the cabinet decisions can also be considered as a resident of UAE. So what is the mean? Excuse me, I have a doubt on which I have a question on the second point. Can I, can I see the slide, the previous slide? Here is a yeah. juridical person incorporated in foreign jurisdictions. In, in, this, in this group, whether the foreign branches will cover the, this uh, group? Foreign so, branches of UAE companies? Uh, no, not me. Uh, if foreign branches uh, located in uh, UAE, but its uh, mother company is not said UAE. So if the mother company is outside UAE, that will be a non-resident. That's what I mean. Yeah. I think I'll just take, I have an example on this after this slide, and uh, that will just help to understand this concept a little better. Oh, okay. So I mentioned that, you know, uh, if an individual is carrying out a business or a business activity in the UAE, then they will be treated as a resident of UAE. So the question is, what exactly is a business activity? And again, this is something which is answered in the frequently asked question. Business activity basically would mean an economic activity carried out by the individual on a continuous basis or maybe a short term basis. So it's not that, you know, to be considered as a business, it has to be carried on for a period of 12 months. Even let's say, for example, if, if it's a short term project of three months, six months or nine months, of course, you know, if, if the individual is a non-resident, then the treaty will also come into play. But let's ignore treaty or assume that the treaty is not, we're just discussing on the UA corporate tax. If an activity is carried out on a continuous or a short term basis, that also can be considered as a business activity, but the activity should be conducted with a profit motive. So any economic activity, whether carried out continuously or on a short term basis by an individual with a profit motive, and where there is some system and organization to conduct the activity is, so organization here does not mean that there has to be a company. This is otherwise just a systematic carrying out of the economic activity will be considered as a business or business activity. Now an individual may do the thing directly or they may incorporate a sole proprietorship. In either of these two cases, these conditions will be applicable. So this is the example on the on a foreign company being considered as a resident of UAE. So in this case, what we've taken is that there is a company in India, FCO. In this company, 40% ownership lies with certain UK shareholders and 60% is with the UAE shareholders. So when you talk about this entity, this is incorporated in India. It has five directors of whom four are permanent tax resident of UA. 
So let's say four directors are here. One director, let's say, is there in UK. The directors conduct majority board meetings in the UAE. So the board meetings are done here. And the strategic decisions are also taken in the UAE. Although this entity, FCO, it has a general manager based in India who looks after the day-to-day -day operation. So the concept of general manager is something which is very, very prevalent in the UAE also. So that's where we've taken this. But basically, the strategic decision and everything is taking place in UAE. In such a case, this company, even though it's a company incorporated in India, under the UAE corporate tax law will be deemed as a UAE resident. So I don't know how many of you are aware, but this is a similar concept of place of effective management, which is there in India also. Now, the problem that comes up in these kind of structures is that generally, just like you know, UAE treats all the companies incorporated in UAE as a resident of UAE, other countries also have similar laws. So let's say if we talk about India itself, any company which is incorporated in India by default is considered as a res resident of India. And therefore, they are liable to pay taxes in India on their global income. In this particular example, whatever would be the global income of this entity, it will be liable to pay tax in India. The problem that comes up is that if this is a deemed as a resident of UAE, then its income will also be taxable in UAE. And the rules for calculating income and taxability will be same as they apply to other UAE residents. So it kind of becomes a little complicated and you know we are seeing more and more cases where actually this is happening. So earlier there used to be a situation that there is an entity in UAE which was controlled from outside UAE. But in the context of India, many people in India also, what they have done is they have moved their base to Dubai and their existing Indian companies are still continuing. And those people are actually still the manager or the decision maker in these Indian entities. In that particular case, this Indian entity may be deemed as a resident of UAE and therefore may be liable to tax in UAE on its global income. I have a question here. Yeah, the no. DTAA shall prevail, but uh, in the DTAA, you know, uh, again, for a for a company, there are specific rules. So maybe let me just, uh, since, since this question has come up, uh, allow me a minute, I will just project one of the DTAAs and uh, show you as to how that is going to apply in this case. So if you actually see, are you able to see my screen right now? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. So here, if you actually see, this is the portion. So it says where by reason of provision of paragraph one, a person other than an individual is a resident of both the contracting states. So in our example, we had a situation where in India, a person was a tax resident because it was incorporated in India. In UAE, it was treated as a resident because the control and management was there. So in those cases, what is going to happen is it shall be deemed to be a resident of a state in which its play for self-effective management is situated, which means that this company can actually take a stand that it should be treated as a foreign company for Indian tax purposes.
Any questions on this? My question is, uh, Indian company, in this case, Indian company had, um, might have revenue in India. So that has to be, uh, city has to be paid in India, right? 20% or 30% is whatever. Right. The problem in this case would be that, um, you know, for a foreign company, if it is treated as a resident of UAE, and India treats this as a non-resident, in India, the rate of tax on a foreign company is 40%. Yeah. So, so even though, the, so even though yeah. theoretically, we can say that we can just take it to be a resident of UAE and pay 9% corporate tax there. If this is a foreign company deriving income from India, then the tax rate is 40%. So one will need to see the arbitrage, evaluate that thing and take a call accordingly. Hmm. But if it, if there is a DTT is in place, then in this case also uh, in the local law uh, will be classified under such companies in deemed uh, UAE resident. Right. In that case, it. you know, obviously in that case, uh, while, you know, as an advisor, if I have to look at this, I would rather have this company pay 25% tax in India, if that's the corporate tax applicable in it. And even if it is deemed as a resident of UAE, you know, in that particular case, you can calculate the UAE corporate tax liability and claim a credit or a set off of this tax, whereby yes. your taxable income here or tax here will be nil. Instead of going in a situation where you claim this to be a UAE resident under the treaty, end up paying 40% here, right? Mm -hmm. And then nothing here. Okay. In this Therefore, case, in, in this case, we are paying 25% in India and that uh, portion might be a huge amount of the tax. That tax can be carried forward to following years? No, generally that does not happen. Uh, now that I think we are stepping two way ahead, that's towards the end of the course sure. that we're going to reach that level. So just to keep parity in terms of, you know, some people might actually be beginning with this. Uh, I think uh, some of the questions, I would keep them for now because I'm we sorry. want to deal that uh, foreign tax credit is something which would come towards the end of the course. Okay. Thank you. But if you have any questions, just feel free to drop me a message on that and I will, uh, I will correct that. Now, when we come to a non-resident person under the UAE corporate tax law, a non-resident person is liable to tax in the UAE on the UAE permanent establishment. And a permanent establishment, the definition of that is something which is given in Article 14. This is in line with the OECD model tax convention. But in addition to this, there are a few clauses which add on to a bit of a complexity and simplifies thing also to some extent. The second is a non-resident person is liable to tax on state sourced income. Now, what is state sourced income? There are examples of that given in article 13, which also we are going to discuss today. And the third one is where there is a state nexus, which may be specified in a cabinet decision. Now, basically, uh, you know, just for in case anyone is not aware, a permanent establishment is nothing, but let's say if a non-resident operates in another country, they have an option that they can either form a company, let's say an LLC, they can open up a branch, which also is treated as a permanent establishment in most of the cases, or they may operate through an agent, or they may be selling certain goods directly to the customer without either of these things. Now, if you look at a person who's incorporated a company in, let's say, UAE, whatever profits they are getting, assuming this is a taxable person, they would pay tax here. But if the same activity is carried out by a non-resident person directly, in that case, they may avoid payment of taxes, even though the level of operations of this entity or this company may be the same. To avoid such situations, most of the tax treaties and most of the international law provide that if a non-resident is carrying out any particular activity directly in such a manner that they have a regular access or a regular establishment, then the profits that they derive will be liable to tax in the host jurisdiction. 
right? Second is state sourced income. Now, a state sourced income can arise in two situations. One where this is attributable or related to the PE. And second, where there is a no permanent establishment. In this context, you know, even though the law does not specifically mention it, if one goes to frequently asked question 68 of the UAE corporate tax law, this provides that merely earning UAE source income would not trigger corporate tax payable or require the foreign entity to register and file for UAE corporate tax. Now, this is a very, very important observation, which is there in the frequently asked question, because what this means is that if there is no permanent establishment, even though a state sourced income may be derived by a non-resident person, they may still not be required to pay any taxes in the UAE. So we will see the examples of this state sourced income. So first one, like I mentioned, amongst the first three was payment attributable to UAP of a foreign company. In this particular case, what is happening is there is a UK company which has a permanent establishment in the UAE. This permanent establishment is actually providing services to another foreign company. Right? And the service fees in respect of this, let's say, is paid directly by this company to the UK entity. So in this case, because this payment that is received by the head office, if I may call it, is in respect of the services provided by the branch, one can say that this payment is attributable to the UAP of the foreign company. Therefore, this income, even if the invoicing is done directly here, the payment is done directly here, is liable to corporate tax in the UAE. And the reason is simple. This is a payment which is attributable to the UAE permanent establishment of a foreign company. So there could be cases where, you know, uh, and uh, I've seen this practically at the time of uh, doing ESR work. In, for the for the Middle East region, many cases, people have branches, foreign companies have branches in the UAE, and these cater to several countries within the Middle East. So when they are providing services to their clients, generally the payment should accrue to them. But even, even in cases where the payment is done directly by these clients to the head office, this is something which is going to be liable to tax in UAE because this is a payment attributable to a UAE branch of a foreign company. Income from sale of goods in the UAE. So again, there are two situations that are there in this particular case. One is the sale of goods can be done by the foreign company outside UAE. So generally when these kind of contracts are done, the contracts are structured to ensure that the property in the goods being transferred is passed on to the buyer, is passed on to the buyer outside UAE. But in some cases, what can happen is that instead of this way, this foreign company may actually have some form of a presence in the UAE, of course, there are cases where you know there are preparatory or auxiliary activities, in which case a PE does not arise. And if this permanent establishment facilitates the sale of these goods, let's say it is scouting for contract sale, concluding contract or negotiating contracts with the customer, then in that case, the income from sale of these goods can be attributed to UAE and therefore it will be liable to tax in UAE. Now, in these cases, you know, one of the exercise that is undertaken is the attribution of profits. What that means is the activity or the profits earned by the UAE, UCO company, the UK company, is attributable to various activities. Let's say if it is into manufacturing, 
manufacture is one part of it sales activity is another part of it and there are certain other things also which might be applicable so what is generally done is that the overall profits are allocated to different activities and generally the act, the profit attributable to the activity done in the uap is something which is liable to tax in ua and for this a detailed transfer pricing exercise or a fact finding exercise is done where it is evaluated that if there was an independent person who was providing same services to let's say this uk company what is the profit margin this person would have made if that profit margin is something which is earned by the uae company or the uap then that is something which is considered adequate for tax purposes uh sorab when you say it would be difficult to trace the income uh sorry i'll go back to the previous slide so are you referring to this particular slide where it is difficult so you know yeah, yeah. so you are right in some cases if there is no trace of uh, any activity being done then it is definitely going to be difficult to trace the income but don't don't forget that now onwards until now a large number of the companies were not doing any form of audit right but later on as the tax law kind of progresses the companies will be required to do audit they will be required to kind of go through that audit process disclosure process and everything in those cases if the expenses are being booked here, <clears throat> then in that case basically these income will get reported in the ua and therefore will be covered for taxation meaning, meaning that uh, just uh, i will say hello yeah can you can you start with you again uh if for a for a, if p has or foreign branch has several projects and those projects uh should um, uh, should have a separate profit and loss account to be maintained or what way we can uh, extract this data easily so if all the projects are actually in the ua then basically you don't need to maintain separate project wise accounting but uh, if these transaction again you are doing with the related parties because of the transfer pricing regulations also you will be required to benchmark each one of them separately each each uh, separate projects we yeah and, if, uh, let's say you are working out with three countries then for yes. country wise profitability you might have to do it or in some cases you know a global basis is also applied in transfer pricing but uh, if all the projects are in uae then the overall profitability of the uae entity or uap is what will be relevant okay okay so summarizing what we discussed uh, in respect of the taxable base if the resident is a juridical person then the taxable income that they derive from the state that is from the activities in the uae or from outside uae both will be liable to uae corporate tax now this will be applicable for both normal resident as well as deemed resident and in respect of individual income derived from uae or outside uae which relates to the business or business activities specified in the ua will be taxable in the hands of the individual why i'm saying specified here is just because of the reason of what we discussed a little while ago that the activities of an individual which will be liable to the ua corporate tax the business activities is something which will be specified by the cabinet as per the provisions of article 11 6 in respect of non residents the income attributable to the ua pe will be liable to ua corporate tax the ua sourced income will be liable of course like we discussed there has to be some nexus or the pe 
and income attributable to the nexus in the UAE. Now, what is nexus is something which is yet to be prescribed. This would be more in the context of, uh, you know, the digital companies who may be selling their products in the UAE, but may not have any form of a physical presence there. Yeah, so we will just cover. So for today's purpose, we, I am not getting into the exemption part. Actually, uh, exemption, uh, various exemptions were something which were before this particular chapter. But I thought if we get into that particular part, we may not be able to finish it today. So we will go on to the taxation of non-residence persons today. And then we will take on exemptions in the next session. Now, in Article 13, the definition of UAE sourced income has been given. And it says that a UAE sourced income is an income which is derived from a resident person. So if an individual is conducting a business or if there's a juridical person who's there, if any income is derived from them, it will be considered as UAE source income. So I think there are two things which we need to be clear on here. One is what is UAE source income and second on the taxation, like I discussed earlier, just because you're getting something outside the UAE will not by itself trigger a tax liability in UAE. Second is payment derived from a non-resident, which is paid or accrued in connection with and attributable to UAP of a foreign company. This is what we discussed in one of the preceding slides. We have detailed slides for each one of them separately, which we will take after this. Income accrued in or derived from activities or contracts performed in the UAE. This could be, let's say, if there is a non-resident, they come to UAE and while staying here, provide services. So that will be covered as activities or contracts performed in UAE. Assets located in the UAE, this could be in the form of rental income or let's say if there's an intangible which is being exploited. Capital invested, this could be in the form of capital gains of UAE entities. The rights used, that is, let's say a non-resident is the owner of certain intangibles. He allows the right use of such rights to a UAE taxable person and gets certain income out of it or services performed or benefited from in the state. All of these will be considered as UAE sourced income. So the important thing is if an income is not UAE sourced income and if it is not attributable to the PE in the UAE, then in any case it is not taxable. But even after one income is UAE sourced income, there also it may be exempt from tax. Now, let's look at this particular example. In this case, we are dealing with income derived from a UAE resident person. So here we have UAE LLC, which is a tax resident of UAE. It pays certain professional fees of AED 675,000 to FCO, which is based out of US. Now, the first question is whether this professional fees can be said to be UAE sourced income. Because this income professional fees is derived from a UAE resident person, it will be covered as a UAE sourced income. What is the withholding tax on this income? Like I mentioned, withholding tax currently in the UAE is 0%. And what will be the UAE corporate tax payable on such income if FCO has a permanent establishment in UAE? Now, if this entity has a permanent establishment in UAE, then this income of 675,000 will be taxable in the UAE. So, 
675,000 is the total in revenue, right? Let's say the exemption, we, we are assuming there are no expenses against this, although impracticable, but for the purpose of calculation, there's an exemption of 375,000. The balance 300,000 will be taxable at the rate of 9%. So the tax payable on this income will be AED 27,000. Insofar as withholding taxes is concerned, when the LLC makes the payment, it does not withhold any taxes, but it's the obligation of the foreign company to pay these taxes by filing appropriate tax return. Payment attributable to a UAP, this I think we just discussed, so uh, we will not discuss it again. Activities or contracts performed in the UA. So let's say, for example, in this particular case, FCO is a foreign company and it has entered into a contract to provide services to ABC UAE. In order to perform these services, certain employees of FCO come to UAE and stay in a hotel. So in this case, the income earned by FCO will be considered as income derived from activities or contracts performed in the UAE and therefore will be considered as a UAE sourced income. Now let's look at that, you know, uh, if this is a UAE sourced income and this hotel constitutes a permanent establishment of the foreign company, how will the taxable income be calculated? So the revenue of FCO1 is 3.07 million. Okay. The salary of the employees, which is annual, is 1 million. Traveling and other direct costs are, let's say, 300,000 dirhams. And allocation of charges at arm's length basis to this permanent establishment is 100,000. Compute the tax liability, assuming the hotel constitutes a PE of FCO1 in UAE and the employee worked in UAE for eight months. Now, before we do this computation, one thing that I just want to kind of uh, clarify, and we are going to discuss this in detail when we talk about permanent establishment. So what we will do is as a part of this course, in addition to the permanent establishment that is covered in article 14, we will also look at some of the OECD model tax convention, article 14, because you know uh, one of the fundamental principle of international taxation is, which is also something which is covered under the UAE corporate tax law is that the domestic tax law and the tax treaties. Whenever there is a conflict between these two provisions, the one which is more beneficial to the taxpayer applies. What that means is if you are looking at any form of taxation of income for a foreign company, which is a tax resident of a country with which UAE has a tax treaty, this foreign company has an option that it can, it can choose to be taxed as per the provisions of the UAE corporate tax law, if they are more beneficial to them. If these provisions are not more beneficial, it can choose to be taxed by the provision of tax treaty if they are more beneficial. So in the present context, under the UAE corporate tax law, there are detailed provision on taxability of income of permanent establishment. This is both in terms of when this would arise and if it arises, then what is the tax rate which is applicable to them? If in the tax treaty, you find certain clauses where you know a PE, the existence of PE itself can be ruled out, then you can properly structure your tax returns to say you don't need to pay any taxes, even though under the UAE corporate tax law, some taxes might be payable. And there's a specific article on this particular provision 
under the UAE corporate tax law itself. It says that wherever UAE has entered into any international agreements and the provisions of those agreements are more beneficial, then those provisions will override the provisions of the UAE corporate tax law. However, that, that, that is subject to one limitation, which is that if someone tries to abuse the provisions of the tax treaty to obtain unfair tax advantage, then there are anti-abuse provisions in the UAE corporate tax law. If those are applicable, then the provision of international tax agreement can be curtailed. Now, coming back to this particular question, would you all uh, try and see as to how you will calculate the income of the permanent establishment? Or let me do this because this is the first one that we are dealing with. So when you calculate the income of a permanent establishment, the first thing is it is calculated as if the permanent establishment is a separate legal entity. If that be the assumption, what is done is that the revenue as well as the expenses are considered as if you are preparing a tax return of an independent company. So in that line, the revenue of the UAE entity is 3.075 million. Whenever you are doing this revenue establishment for a permanent establishment, what you need to also see is that if any of this revenue is from related parties or the head office, then you need to apply the transfer pricing regulations and see that this revenue meets the arm's length criteria. We are assuming that that criteria has been met here and accordingly, we are just taking the revenue as it is. Second is, when you deduct cost, you would deduct as if these are the cost incurred by the PE. So salaries of employee is 1 million dirhams. Now, can anyone tell me in terms of how much uh, salary should we take here? Eight months. Actually, it would not be the same cost because uh, one of the points that has been mentioned is that the employees actually worked only for eight months. So because this is the annual salary, so we will take this as eight by 12, or in other words, two third of the salary is what is going to get charged to the permanent establishment. The remaining is something which the head office or this entity would bear. So let's say we'll take 666,000, or let's say just for ease of reference, let's take it 667,000. Although the number will be, triple six, triple six, point six, six, seven, and so on. Traveling and other direct cost attributable to the permanent establishment is 300,000. The allocation of charges at arm's length is 100,000. Now this determination of arm's length would need to be done under the transfer pricing rules and regulations separately. So the total cost actually comes to 100,000 and the profit will be calculated accordingly. On this profit, there will be an exemption of 375,000 dirhams and the remaining will be taxed at 9%. In other words, the calculation process is just like any other entity, but the specifics here is one, the revenue has to be tested for um, transfer pricing. If it is with the related party, the expenses have to be charged only in respect of the period for which the employee or other assets were used by the permanent establishment. Any direct cost will be deducted in full and any cross charges of allocation will be considered at arm's length. Now, while we will discuss this aspect also when we talk about permanent establishment, in some treaties, this allocation of charges is prohibited. 
in that case, you can always see whether under the domestic tax law also there is a possibility of claiming them and claim it as a deduction. Now, here is a slight variation of a question that we took earlier. There is a foreign company that sells goods and the profit is US dollar 300,000 to a mainland company. We need to calculate the tax liability if the foreign company has a permanent establishment in UAE as per the UAE corporate tax law, but does not have a PE under UAE USA tax treaty. Any guesses as to what would be the tax liability here? Okay, let me answer that. So basically, you know, like I mentioned, the provisions in respect of a tax treaty are applicable based on the domestic tax law or the tax treaty, whichever are more beneficial. In this particular case, under the domestic tax laws of UAE, there is a PE, but under the tax treaty, there is no PE. Therefore, a taxpayer can opt for the provisions of tax treaty and on this profit of USD 300,000, it need not pay any taxes if it does not have a permanent establishment in the UAE. Provision of services that are rendered or utilized or benefited from in the state. Now, the example is the same, what we looked at a little earlier, but in this case, again, what happened was there was a foreign company, its employees were sitting in a hotel and providing services. Right, The services were rendered physically in UAE, therefore it will be considered as a UAE sourced income. They were utilized in the UAE because it's a domestic company that is using these services for its own business and the benefited from in the UAE, in the state. So all these headings that we have here are basically the headings for the respective corporate tax provisions, which were there. Income from contract wholly or partly performed or benefited from in the state. Again, in the same example, if you see, suppose there's a contract between these two entity. This contract is partly performed in the UAE, right? If the entire work was done by these employees only, then it will be wholly performed in the UAE. Therefore, the income under this contract that goes out will be treated as UAE sourced income. Now, one thing which is a little different is that of part performance of a contract. So let's say, for example, let's forget this for a moment and let's just change the facts a little bit. In this particular case, let's say there was certain offshore services. That is some part of the services was done by the foreign company or the employees of the foreign company sitting outside UAE and some part of the services was done by the employees in the UAE. But let's say the consideration was a consolidated one. In such a case, one is a UAE sourced income because it is being rendered or partly performed or used in the UAE. The other part may be totally different in terms of the work, etc that is there. Now, in these situations, what is done is that a fact finding analysis has to be done, whereby it is seen, does the permanent establishment has any role to play in whatever services are provided here? In many cases, you know, uh, I mean, globally, if you see, there are cases where they have actually attributed the entire income earned here to the permanent establishment and taxed it in the source state. One would just need to wait and see what developments are done in respect of further guidance is issued in respect of these attribution issues and permanent establishment issues, because 
the current state of affairs is in the law, it says that a state sourced income will be taxed. But in the FAQs which are there, there's a clear mention, the FAQ 68 that I mentioned, that just because it's a UAE sourced income, it will not be taxed unless and until there is a further permanent establishment that can be done. Income from movable property or immovable property in the UAE. So let's say if there is a non-resident and he derives property, rent. So first thing is, what if this individual, this non-resident is an individual? If this non-resident is an individual and he's deriving income in a personal capacity and he's not carrying out a business, then this income will be exempt. But if this is being done as a business activity, then this may be liable to tax in the UAE. Similarly, because in the case of individual, if he's carrying out a business activity, he's treated as a resident. Similarly, let's talk about if this non-resident was actually a foreign company. If they are also carrying out this business, and let's say they have an estate manager, and it has an office. This is again an example which is given in the FAQs itself, who's managing all these different properties, collecting rent, entering into lease and everything. Then the rental income earned here will be liable to tax in UAE. Of course, one of the other aspect which is important in this particular case is the provisions of the tax treaty. So if the tax treaty provides an exemption, still this income can be claimed to be exempt from tax treaties. So let's look at one another simple example in this particular case. Let's say the rental income earned from the various properties is 300,000 per month. In other words, it's 3.6 million. Salary of the estate manager who constitute a permanent establishment in UAE is 100,000. We can take it per month also. That's not a problem. The taxes and duties paid in respect of rent is 30,000. So the total income in this particular case will be 30,000. Now, unlike you know, in some other countries like India where there is a deemed deduction for these expenses, there's no specific mention insofar as this kind of income is concerned on any deemed basis. So the normal income for this will also be calculated as if it were business income only. After allowing for the exemption limit, which is 375,000, tax will be payable on 1995,000 at the rate of 9%. Income from disposal of shares or capital of a resident person. Now, think of a situation where a non-resident has 100% capital ownership of a UA company, and it sells these shares to another foreign company. Of course, there are no withholding tax provisions, so this entity will not withhold any UA corporate tax here. So the question is, will these capital gains be liable to tax in UA or will they be exempt? So two situations can arise. One, if the foreign company has a permanent establishment in the UAE and this capital income is actually, capital gains is actually a business income, right? Second is there is no PE and this is just a sales simplicitor of the shares. So the thing is that under the UAE corporate tax law, any capital gains arising on sale of the shares of this entity will not be liable to UA corporate tax. The only situation where this could be taxable is if it's constituting a business income and this foreign company has a permanent establishment in the UAE. Else the capital gain arising on this transfer will be exempt under the UAE corporate tax law.
Uh, I think we've overshot our time today because the class was supposed to be until 7 p.m. Uh, this is the last form of income. Actually, there are three of them. We'll quickly go through these three and uh, then we'll close for the day. Uh, I would definitely write, reach out to you in terms of one, the timing of the course, because uh, there were many people who suggested that we should do it over the weekend. Yeah. So this one is basically right to use an intangible or intellectual property in the UAE. So let's say a foreign company has a brand which it allows a local person to use. So let's say if this were an accounting firm, they allow the use of their brand to this entity and they use this brand to provide services. And in turn, they paid brand royalty. So this brand royalty is something which will be treated as a UAE sourced income. The next one is interest. If any interest is paid by a UAE company, on the loan that it takes, it will be considered as a UAE sourced income, provided it is secured by movable or immovable property located in UAE. And the borrower is either a resident or a government entity. So wherever there is a borrowing done by the resident person or a government entity, which is secured by a movable or immovable property in the UAE, then the interest paid will be considered as UAE sourced income. However, let's say the contrary would mean that if this property is situated outside UAE, or if the interest is taken by a non-resident, it may not actually get covered under these provisions. And the last one is that where a UAE entity takes a coverage under an insurance policy and makes a payment of premium to a foreign company, in respect of insurance of an asset which is located in the UAE and the borrower is either a resident or a government entity, the insurance premium will be considered as UAE sourced income. Okay, uh, your point is well noted, Saurabh. Uh, I mean, unless the majority or I mean, I would prefer that everyone agrees. So uh, we would not want to change the time. But uh, the preference from my side would also be to keep on weekdays only. But we'll just run this poll to see how everyone feels about this. So that, you know, uh, everyone's objective is met. We'll definitely consider that. So with that, I think we'll wrap up the session today. We've overrun. Actually, I didn't realize as we were discussing so uh, what we will do is in the next two days, uh, we will provide you with a recording of this particular session, which will be uploaded in the access part of your uh, course only. Second, uh, in the WhatsApp group where uh, you guys are there, we're going to discuss and circulate the agenda for the next meeting. Like I mentioned in the beginning of the next session, in the next session, we would request that, uh, you know, uh, you have your questions ready, whatever you might have in respect of this particular session and ask them and uh, we will consider that accordingly. So thank you everyone. This was the first session. So uh, we try to, and you know, the law is somewhat a bit broken on one side or the other. So it was a little bit difficult to consolidate in terms of what curriculum should we do so that the session is more and more available. If there are any suggestions, please feel free to drop us a message on the number that you have and uh, we'll try to address it in the next session. You have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.